growing up is hard enough without feeling as though you're in the shadow of not only your brother, but your mother and father too. To call Martha Wainwright the daughter of a legendary musical family is a mere starting point. The highly acclaimed singer-songwriter has always had her own story to tell in music and in life. She's now laid that bear in an incredibly frank and captivating memoir titled Stories I Might Regret Telling You. And it's a pleasure to welcome Martha Wainwright to our virtual studio from Montreal, Quebec. Hello. Hi. It's very nice to meet you. Um, you admit in the book that writing the book was a thorn in your side for about seven years, and that if your mother was alive, you might not have written it. Uh, what made you decide to follow through in writing your memoir? Well, I didn't want to have to give back the advance for <laughs> the main reason, you know, but also because I had, I had worked I worked hard on it. I. I was very, you know, I, I felt very like, you know, it, it spoke to my ego and, and, and to my vanity when I was asked to do it. And I thought, okay, well, I'll write a book. Um, but then I, you know, a year went by and I thought, okay, I better get started on this book that I said I was going to write. And then I got into it and it would prove to be quite difficult, you know, because it's, you know, I had never done anything like this before. And, um, it was uh, really intense, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of um, um, uh, it was a lot of process. And I and I wrote a lot, and then I took a lot out, and then I changed it, and then a couple of years went by where I didn't touch it at all because I thought I can't, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm, it's too much. And then I went back to it and thought, no, I do want to do this, and I want to try and figure out you know, what I want to say and what I think is important and, and get rid of some of the stuff that I don't think is that important and have it be funny, but also have it be, you know, tell my story, which was, there was some sad stuff in there too. So, um, it was hard, but I'm really, and I'm really glad it's over <laughs> and I don't regret it at all, you know, but, um, I'm glad it happened. Well, I was going to ask if you do regret it, but you, because the title says stories I might regret telling you, and it's good to hear that you don't regret it. Um, but your ex-husband used an earlier draft against you in your divorce, and you also write about other people who are still alive. Was it difficult to decide to share as much as you did, even when you were telling other people's stories, like your dad, for example? Um, well, you know, the stories of my family and, and that, that relate to my dad, you know, there's stories that, that have already been exposed a little bit in... Um, in uh, articles and even in songs that we've written and also my, my dad's own book, uh, Liner Notes, it's called, you know, where he talks about um, um, uh, my mom and, and, and also says he wrote who he was married to and sort of the ins and out a little bit of their divorce and their, their, their being together in their marriage. And so it wasn't anything that was a shocker, I don't think, to, to anybody who... Um, who knew our family story a little bit, and also I think that it's it's uh, although although it's not an everyday family, our family, we are touched by the same things that uh, most families are touched by, and and some some of those things are taboo, and some of those are difficult, and um, separation and divorce and and remarriage and and dynamics and in family and and jealousy and 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 so I think that people probably um, recognize pretty quickly some of these uh, themes in, um, and have experienced them themselves. Um, you did say that uh, a lot of these stories, especially with your dad, were known. But I think on the first page, uh, you kind of punch the reader in the gut because you uh, write this uh, story that your father actually wished that your mother had an abortion. And that's a very personal and hurtful thing to share. Um, so why share that? Um, well, I mean, I started it, you know, at the beginning of my life, and I had heard, I was told that that story, and it, that when I found that out, I was very upset. Um, and that sort of set me on, I think, a course through the book that you see of someone who is really un, um, lacks security and, and lacks feeling of, of um, confidence and knowing that about my about my beginning didn't didn't help. Um, and then I pretty quickly go on to talk about my own uh, um, marriage and that I myself, you know, um, 
terminated a pregnancy in my while I was married after having children. And I think the idea, and I hopefully this comes across, is not so much that I blame my parents or my father for um, making that kind of those making decisions like that and 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 um, you know uh, considering uh, uh, having an abortion, I think that that's something that that a lot of people have to do. You know, it was more sort of whether or not I should have been told that when I was a teenager, you know that that was maybe too much information to give to a young person. and um, and so, yeah, my father definitely ends up being, you know, a, kind of a, a target. In, in the book, um, uh, on the first page in particular, but I think that hopefully the book sort of um, shows very much in a love and appreciation and a respect for him, and um, that that's not the takeaway. I, I hope not. Um, no, it, it's definitely you saw the progression in your relationship, and I think when we're young, we kind of see our parents as if they belong to us, um, and then yeah. we, as we get older, we start seeing them as individuals, uh, people who had their own dreams and wishes and problems. Um, do you think that you grew to understand him better as you got older and when you became a parent? When I became a parent, yes, but I think more, even more when I became a songwriter, you know, and I had, I had written songs about, about his family, um, uh, members. And, and then I started doing the same thing. And I started repeating the same, perhaps bad habits that, that my parents had. Um, we have a picture of your dad with his uh, grandson, your dad, Logan. Yeah. Yeah, and my dad loud and Wayne Wright the third, and he's holding uh, my youngest son Francis Valentine, and um, so I I connected with my dad through music, you know, and also through we have the same life in many ways, you know, traveling from city to city, singing our songs, being troubadours, you know, and that's really um, where we understand each other. The best, you know. And as a parent, I'm I'm uh, I'm a different type of parent. I'm much more like my mom was, but um, I don't um, I don't really I don't I, I I was really considering him more as an artist in this book, um, and but also as a father, of course. But really, really more our connection as artists. Well, it's one thing to say you are the child of famous singers, but in your case, you were right up there with them from a very young age. We have a picture here. Uh, here you are at the, at the Newport Folk Festival. How did you come to be a part of the act? You know, we started off as, you know, young people singing. When we were young in the summertime, we would go on uh, tour with our mom and, and aunt and sometimes with my dad and we were we didn't have babysitters, so what what they had to do something with us, so we had to get up on stage and sing. That's a pretty <laughs> great solution. <laughs> it sounds like a great childhood. Uh, but just to illustrate how this truly was the family business, here you are with the extended McGarrigal and Wainwright clans at one of your annual Christmas shows. <laughs> Is there anyone in your family who can't sing? Do you have any accountants, bakers? <laughs> We've got a couple who can't sing, but we make sure that they stay afar from the microphone. <laughs> we don't want to tell them. We don't. They don't know. So we just sort of pretend that they can. <laughs> were, you, were, you, were you always uh, resolute in becoming a, mu a musician? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think that it was, it was very natural. I always liked the stage as a young person, like many young people do who like to be, you know, in theater and, and, uh, singing songs and in their, in their bathroom and the bath or stuff, but, and stuff, but I, um, I was a good, good enough student. I was kind of a little bit lazy, but I was a good enough student. But I did realize I had one math teacher who told me when I was in grade nine, she was mad at me because I, you know, my homework wasn't done properly. And she said, what do you want to do all your life? Sing and dance? And I thought, yeah, that, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> that sounds about right. Probably. <laughs> I wanted to read uh, an excerpt from uh, your book. And this is about your mom, Kate. Uh, you write. Okay. Kate was often frustrated with me to the point of being hurtful. 
She broke some cardinal parenting rules, like talking shit about my dad. But then she would raise him up to an almost godlike position, saying how great a singer he was and that he was underappreciated. She couldn't always control her temper, but I couldn't control mine either. There were scenes. She occasionally told me I was mediocre. Hearing your mom call you mediocre, what effect did that have on you? Well, I, I, once again, I think it was something that she shouldn't have said, you know, and um, um, and it was very painful. But I, I think I go on to say that, you know, I don't, I don't think that, I don't really think that she, she might have meant it, but I think that she wanted me to be as good as I could be, you know, and I had always had trouble um, sort of taking the reins and um, taking control of, of the talent that I might have and sort of going as far as I could with it. And I think she had seen me over the years sort of repeatedly um, shoot myself in the foot a little bit and make mistakes and sort of do not a great performance when there was important people in the audience and not do a great performance when there was no one in the audience or, you know, um, be self-destructive um, and sort of not take my work seriously. And I think that she was, uh, and, and it wasn't, I'm not trying to make excuses for her because no one should ever call anybody mediocre, especially not a, a, a young person and their, and their kid. But I think that, um, I like to think that she believed in me and she wanted to see me um, live up to my potential. How, you know, when you do hear that, it kind of, uh, like reading the, your memoir, it seemed to kind of sow a seed of like doubt in you. How long mm -hmm. did it take for you to silence that doubt? About 25 years after starting. I mean, I think it's, this is the recent, the newer me, I guess, is has, um, really let a lot, a let that go, you know, and it, but it's taken me a long time. You know, everyone has their different way of getting there. And, uh, for me, it required doing shows for 25 years and, you know, um, making many albums and finally feeling, okay, well, I'm, I'm just as good, you know, uh, as my parents and my brother. And it's not, you know, I finally, it was my, my kind of, um, slower paced, uh, attempt to, to be at the table and, um, and just to feel, just to feel, um, good about it. You write, um, about your brother Rufus, lots of funny stories about the sibling rivalry you both had. I think when you came from the hospital, the story was that he poured a glass of grape juice over your head. Yes, that's correct. And then there's a story of how you tripped him. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And almost killed him. No, yeah, but, we were, you know. <laughs> but now you're, um, you're, you, you um, admire each other and you love each other very much. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt from the book uh, that mm -hmm. you write. Though I was a daughter of twice over, doors seemed close to me in stark contrast to the attention paid to the sons of musical stars. I knew and hung out with all those boys in New York and LA, Teddy Thompson, Sean Lennon, Chris Stills, Harper Simon, and the list goes on and on. I liked them. They were my friends, but they were all getting signed and written about and had publicists and photo shoots and beautiful girlfriends. Were their songs better than mine? Were their songs more genuine? I think Bloody Mother effing A-hole is really about getting the short end of the stick. And I made a little edit because I can't say those words on TV. Um, what has it been like for you as a woman in the music industry? Um, well, I, especially at the beginning, it felt, you know, like um, there, there were more barriers. There you are performing. Barriers. Yeah, there I am singing. Mm -hmm. Especially at the beginning, it certainly felt that there were more barriers, and and I and I I imagine that is also because of the way that I felt about myself, you know, and didn't think I was good enough or or pretty enough or talented enough or good enough at my instrument, and so there was a lot of insecurity that played into that. But I would say that there it, it was kind of odd to me that at the time, you know, there was all of these guys getting so much attention and we weren't hearing so much from the daughters of these rock stars. And we, we haven't as much at all. You know, there are some, some breakaways from that. But I guess, 
you know, as as women, as young women uh, in particular, we were sort of t taught to still, you know, uh, um, you know, get married or get a job and sort of, you know, get on with your life and not uh, to become kind of a stage person or, or rock and roller or a musician was still and is still to this day, you know, not it, it, it's it's a different path than a lot of women take. And I think it's because there's not as many there's not as many examples. And I think also in history of women in, in rock and women in music, there's always a sort of darkness associated with the change. You can't be a good mother and also be playing at nighttime in, in music venues and surrounded by, you know, unsavory people or something. Or um, certainly there are, there are unfortunately, you know, in the past in music, a lot of women who were, who were singers some of them had bad, had difficult times being being a parent and being accepted, and so I think that there's an image that we have of that, you know, of sort of the the the, the wild, crazy woman who's, mm -hmm. you know, drinks too much and is just sort of destined to to die in obscurity, you know, somewhere. And it and it's it's really unfortunate, and I think it does set up this um, feeling that it's not possible or not good or not uh, viable, you know, which, which is, um, which is too bad. And I would imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm going to venture to guess that I probably get paid less than, than uh, men who um, have my job and who sell as many records as I do, you know, which is not that many, but just, I think that that's really, unfortunately, still the case. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're 100% right. Um, in the yeah. book, you mentioned that um, singers like Nina, Nina Simone and Judy Garland uh, were looked upon differently because they wanted to pursue their careers. Um, and I wanted to bring your mom back into this. Uh, you detail the years of hard work, but also the trade-offs that um, uh, your mom, Kate McGarrigal, uh, uh, she was in a duo with your aunt, uh, Anna, uh, and some of the trade-offs that they had to make. They both put their careers on pause to raise their kids. We've got a picture of them there with all y'all. Um, how did that um, affect their careers, having to um, kind of choose between the domestic life and uh, wanting to be successful in the in the music industry. Well, you know, they were they 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 wanted to, for the most part, stay, stay home with their kids and 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 be present with the, um, at, at home. And I understand that instinct very much. That I would love to uh, be able to do that, but I have to go out and work <laughs> and make a living. Um, and Kate and Anna were lucky enough to have written um, a handful of really great songs that other women sang, and that really. Put us through college, as as my mom used to say. You know, Linda Ronstadt sang um, "Heart Like a Wheel," and uh, Emmy Lou Harris sang some of their songs. They were on some anonymous Gory. so that really afforded them the ability to stay home more. Um, that being said, um, I think that especially for my mother, she really wished that she could have taken her or their career further and gone into the upper echelons of female songwriters, you know, and um, if we think of J Joni Mitchell, which we weren't allowed to listen to as kids because because my mother was, uh, was so jealous in many ways, you know, <laughs> that kind of commitment to music, you know, was, would not have, was not conducive to her being at home with her kids. And so she did make a decision and, and I understand the decision that she made and it's, and I, I myself now I'm sort of trying to um, balance the two. And you know, everyone talks about balancing, balancing, you want balance in your life. I don't know if there's ever any balance for real. It's just sort of walking a tightrope and just teetering and hoping that you don't fall. And I think we still live, we do live in a society that uh, says to women that you can do everything, but uh, you have to do all these things, be you know attractive for your partner, be great at your job, be great parent. There's no room for failure. There's no room for failure. And also, once you're doing your job, being, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or a journalist or whatever, and then being a great mom, and then you're expected to look good doing it, then it also clean up, you know, like, and then you feel bad if you don't pass a vacuum or what. It's just like, it's a little bit much. And, um, and I, you know, I sound like I'm complaining about my, my life and how hard it is because my life is, is, is very, um, um, 
I'm, I'm blessed, you know, and I have a lot of privilege, you know, and I have a lot of, 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 of help and, you know, with, with, with managers and, you know, people help me out a lot, but, um, so I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, you know, complaining about my situation at all, you know, um, but I just do, um, uh, and in a way it makes sense, you know, there's so little time on this planet. You do want to do it all, you know what I mean? And, but, but I, I'm, I feel finally, you know, at, I'm, I'll be 46 next month. You know, I feel a little calmer, you know, that the kids are, 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 happy in school, which is like the most important thing, you know, it's like just keep things rolling, keep things going. I'm just excited about going to the beach. That's all I want to do at this point. <laughs> Will we get to go to the beach? That's, that's the priority number. How many books have I sold? I don't know. Will I get to go to the beach? That's I'm right there I with you. But I honestly, I don't think, I don't think you were complaining. I think we don't, uh, I think a lot of women don't feel like they have the permission to talk about this stuff, right? And, um, right. you know, uh, you, in the book, you write about your relationship with your mother. And I wonder too, if um, her and her sister were able to, felt as if they could talk about those things. There's a picture of you and your mom. Um, yeah. Your mom died when she was uh, 63 and she died shortly after you had your first child. Uh, how, how did her death affect you? Um, you lost your mother while you became a mother? Well, you know, I was always kind of a, I was a kind of a hot mess when I was in my 20s, just very wild and lots of, I mean, not, 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 it's not that terrible, but I was just like kind of partying and having fun and um, making records, but kind of, you know, like, mm, I was dedicated to it, but I was just kind of like flailing a little bit in, in a way. And then, and then I had to be like a, Adult, you know, I had a young child who was born premature and had and had some real issues, and then, you know, my mom died, and then I and I had like and I like owned a house and then owned this other house and then I had to pay all this mortgage and I had to, and I was like alone in many ways and really sad and I really had to sort of pull it together and in that way it changed my life and I think, you know, in in many ways it it. Um, it forced me to to grow up, which I think was good, and I and I could feel her helping me along the way. When I would say, "Okay, what would what would Kate do, or what would Kate want me to be doing right now, or how can I do the best that I can um, for her?" You know, she, her life has been has been cut so short. You know, and I just wanted her to be proud of me and to to um, um, you know make it you know, enjoy and, and, ha and have, use the time that I have on this planet to, to, to do good things and to make good music and to be a good mom and, and all of that stuff. So in that way, it kind of really, um, changed my outlook. And it, I think it made me a little less selfish and navel gazing. And it just kind of sort of shocked me into sort of, uh, responsibility more, which, which, which needed to happen. And, um, and it also made me take on more of her personality traits. And I think that I've, I've been lucky to, to do that because she was such an incredible person. So I like, you know, I really wanted to absorb some of her brilliance and, and I was open to that. Um, you know, your career really took off after what I will call <laughs> BMFA. Um, yeah. A lot of people assume that this uh, song was about your dad. But in the book, you say that it wasn't necessarily about your dad. So two-prong question. Um, when your career took off, was it the career you wanted? Or did you have other things that you wanted to achieve? And who is the song directed to? Um, well, I think I'm, I'm happy now in my career. I, God knows I'm, I feel like I'm doing enough and I'm, <laughs> I'm working hard and I can't, and I can't do much better with what I have. I'm just tr trying my best and that's good enough finally for me, you know, and, and I'm not so worried about it. And the song is about not being taken seriously as I think I, I wrote in that in the book, but also the song very quickly from the first moment that I sang it in public, um, people started to listen to it and close their eyes and sing along. I would look out into the audience as they sang along to the words and I realized that this song has absolutely nothing to do with me. 
and my dad. It has only to do with what these pers- these people in the audience needed to be about in that in their lives in that moment. And so it became more of an anthem, I think, and for them, for 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 whoever's listening to it, you know, kind of a useful song. Well, in our final moments together, I just want to play another clip, and this is the music video from the title song of your latest album, uh, which came out last summer, called "Love Will Be Reborn." Let's take a listen. I'm going to guess that those were your sons? Yes. Yes. So if your sons came to you in, I don't know, 15 years, 10 years, and said, this is what I want to do, I want to go into music, you would say what? I would say good luck. No, I would say <laughs> absolutely, and I and I will help them to do that as much as they want me to do, but also um, to take to take their time and to let the, and to, I think most importantly, enjoy the music part of it, you know, and to that, that's the most important part of it. How does the music make you feel? How does playing your instrument make you feel? How does singing make you feel? And, and that, you know, that is the thing that, that that's the most important part of it. Uh, And so Martha, I'm going to say something that might sound uh, a little petty, but it's a little unfair as to how gifted you are. This is one of the best books that I've ever read. Um, it is funny. It is engaging. Oh it's goodness. so honest. Uh, so it oh just seems goodness. it seems a little unfair that not only are you a great singer songwriter uh, and beautiful, but like your writing, <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to uh, appreciate your candid um, uh, uh, memoir, and I appreciate you writing it. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. That's really really kind. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nan Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.